This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. This is the second lecture that goes with Chapter 10 of the notes, DCF Techniques. In the previous uh, lecture, we revised net present value calculations. In this second one, again, a, a bit more revision, but we're going to look at internal rate of return. Again, it's something you've done before, uh, paper F9 or 2.4, depending on which syllabus you were doing. Um, so there should be no problem. But again, it is important, so make sure that you, you definitely are happy with it. Now, in the notes, it, um, what we're going to look at to remind you is example 2 on page 48. A but, as you can see, um, example 2 is asking us to calculate the internal rate of return um, for the project we dealt with in example 1, which was the last lecture. So if you've not done example 1, please do go back and have a look at it, either by yourself or um, using the lecture um, that's available here. And so, without obviously redoing the whole of example 1, if you do look back, in example one, we set up the cash flows from the project. We ended up with net cash flows, as you've got here, um, 2,414 and so on. The cost of capital was 10%, so we discounted at 10% using the tables and ended up with a net present value of 258. We therefore accept the project. Here, we're asked for the internal rate of return. And remember, the definition of the internal rate of return, the internal rate of, in, uh, of return is that rate of interest that gives a net present value of zero. Now, I'll remind you uh, later how we might use this figure, but in terms of just pure definition, we simply want to calculate what rate of interest would make the MPV of the project equal to zero. Clearly, it's not 10%. 10% is 258. I hope equally clearly it's somewhat more than 10%, because the higher the cost of capital, the higher the interest rate, uh, the less worthwhile the project would be. And of course, we want an NPV of zero. We want the NPV to be lower. Well, the only way you'd ever be expected to calculate the standard internal rate of return um, is the approach you should have seen before, the two-guess approach, where having done it at 10% and got a positive NPV, we make a second guess at somewhat higher than 10% and then approximate to the IRR. So let's make a second guess. Um, in fact, you can choose any figure you like. I would generally, uh, in this case, when we've done it at 10, I'd generally make a second guess at either 15 or 20. But there's no rule here. Anything sensible would do. But I'm going to do it at 15%. Well, of course, there's very little work involved because we've already got the cash flows. Uh, from example one, and the cash flows themselves don't change. Uh, all we're going to do is rediscount using 15% instead of 10. So our discount factors uh, from the tables 0.870756. The present values multiply by the discount factors. Uh, 
sorry, 1507 times 0 0.497, <coughs> 749, and therefore the NPV at 15% is what? Uh, I think it's minus 59. Again, we want an MPV of 0. In fact, it's, I think, clearly very close to 15%. But if we're a bit more precise, um, I said earlier, you have obviously should have done uh, internal rates of return before. Uh, many of you will have learned a formula. And if you've learned a formula, fine. Use the same formula to work out the IRR. Uh, I personally don't use a formula simply because it's not on the formula sheet. And I think the danger is always that the one time you forget it is in the middle of an exam. Uh, I set it up a tiny bit differently, but it gives exactly the same answer. And effectively, all I'm doing effectively is writing the formula. So any way you like, uh, as long as you get the same answer as me. Uh, but all I do is set up the two. You see, at 10%, the MPV was plus 258. At 15%, the MPV was minus 59. Uh, we want MPV 0, so it's somewhere between the two, and we're going to approximate, assuming it's linear. And so, I simply say, well, over a change of five percentages, the MPV fell. It fell from plus 250 to minus 59, so the total fall, surely, it fell by, what, 317. Now, we're going to assume it's linear. Remember, we're starting from a guess of 10%. To get an MPV of 0, we need the, that MPV to fall by 258. We know that 317 is 5%. We'll just effectively a portion, take a fraction. I can write the IRR down immediately. It's 10% plus a bit. We knew it was more than 10. How much more? Well, we want a fall to 0 of 258. We know that 317 is 5%, so we'll take that fraction of 5%. And if you check me, the internal rate of return here is 14.07% to two decimal places. It's actually a bit silly to put it to two decimal places because remember, it is in fact only approximate because the relationship is not linear. So all we can really say is it's about 14%. Um, I would leave it to do places, just so the examiner can check what you've done. However, can I repeat? It doesn't matter how you go about doing the internal rate of return. If you've learnt a formula, by all means, use your formula. But however you do it, you should end up with the same answer. If you don't, go back and check your workings. So there we are. I mean, the extra work involved there is tiny. But obviously, make sure you've no problem with it. However, let's talk just for a few moments about why we might be interested in that figure uh, and what problems there are. The real reason why we might be interested in it is it does effectively give us what you might call a break-even. You see, if the cost of capital is 10%, that's what we thought the cost of capital was in part one, if it's 10%, then the project is worthwhile, assuming the cash flows are accurate. But of course, a problem is that the cost of capital might not be 10%. It's impossible to calculate that accurately. What if it's 11%? What if it's 12%? And so on. Obviously, if it's 11%, the MPV will be lower. But provided it's positive, I still want to accept. I'm only 
uh, in a panic uh, if the MPV were to go to go negative. Well, since we've got an IRR, we know what the MP, um, rate of interest gives zero. Can we not say that provided the cost of capital is less than 14.07, then we're okay to accept. If it's less than 14.07, the MPV will be positive and we're happy to accept. But of course, if ever it's more than 14.07, then we should reject. And effectively, it gives us a margin for ever error. You see, if the internal rate of return was 20%, I'm not really very bothered. We think it's 10. It may be wrong, but there's no way it's going to be so much wrong. I'll be quite happy accepting. But if the internal rate of return was 11%, I'd be a lot more scared. You know, we think it's 10. Could be wrong. It could easily perhaps be 11 or more. Well, then it'd be a lot more risky. So that's the real use of the internal rate of return gives a margin for error. The problem is though that people tend to use it slightly differently. What they tend to say is, oh, the cost of capital is 10. This project, oh, the internal rate of return is 14. And they say, fine, if you're borrowing at 10 and getting a return of 14, then obviously you should accept. Now, that's not strictly true. Uh, I've already said IRR does give a margin for error, but the point is the IRR isn't actually a rate of return itself. It is just break-even. And so it's a little bit cheating with figures. I mean, it works here. Borrow at 10, return of 14, obviously accept. It works. It's an easy way of explaining. But it's not strictly valid. Um, and the, the reason being that although it works here, and very, very often it works, you know, the explanation, um, there are really a few problems. Um, I'm afraid you'll have to take my word for the problems. It really would be wasting your time to go through them in detail. If you need, look back to your paper F9 or old paper 2.4 notes. But one problem is that there can, in fact, be more than one internal rate of return. Now, so you'll have to take my word for it, but it is possible uh, it happens with projects where the cash flows keep changing sign, where you get inflows, then you get outflows, and so on. There can be more than one internal rate of return, and then the logic of this sort of explanation becomes a bit silly. Another problem is that if you're comparing projects, you can't validly compare internal rates of return. Now again, I'm not going to do a full example here to be wasting your time, but just to explain very, very briefly what I mean. If there were two projects, and one gave an internal rate of return of 15%, and another had 18%, you couldn't necessarily say that B was the better project. Now there's several reasons that could happen, but just imagine if the amount you invested In A, you were able to invest 100,000. In B, you could only invest 1,000. Well, which one would you prefer? You know, I'm, uh, this isn't a detailed explanation, 
But if you have money to invest, you've got 100,000, and if you want, you can invest all of it at 15%. Or you can invest a thousand of it at 18, and the rest does nothing. Uh, then I think you'd probably prefer Project A. I'd rather have a lower return on a lot more money. Um, now, I say that was just a brief explanation of the reasons this can happen. But you can't validly compare projects. You can't automatically say B is better at 18 as against 15. You can only really use the, inter the NPV. There's no question. The higher the NPV, the better the project. And finally, although really the reason behind those two statements is the IRR effectively assumes that cash inflows are reinvested at the internal rate of return. But ours had an internal rate of return of uh, about 14%. If you were going to use the IRR, Um, to make decisions, you would be effectively assuming that you were able to reinvest the returns at 14%. Well, for all those reasons, although the standard internal rate of return as we've done it is very common in real life and exams and is important, your examiner suggests a slight alternative something called the modified internal rate of return. Now, we'll explain that in the next lecture, but yet again, we are going to be using the same example. And so make sure you're happy where we are so far, that you're happy with the NPV, you're happy with calculating the standard IRR. If you are, then go on to the third lecture and we'll look at the modified internal rate of return.